not get stuck over. Okay. All right. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Acts chapter 2. In my life, I've worked a lot of jobs. I started working when I was 14 years old. And back then, I was catering. My first catering was 16 hours, and every every time after that, it was always a lot of work, and so that's the attitude I took with me to every job afterwards, is this is going to be a lot of work, and when the recession hit, I was going to college, and I couldn't afford the next semester. So I started working at Starbucks. And I worked at Starbucks for seven years. Wow. It was a recession. (laughs) It was a recession. And steady work. But, you know, you stuck with it. I, in that time, I remember there were so many people that did not change jobs. People like me stayed at the company for three, four, five years, and I stayed for far too long, let me tell you. If I am never behind a coffee maker again, it will be too soon. (laughs) Which, of course, if anyone's watching from the UCC and remembers my days at Cafe Esperanza, then you know I spent far too many years there as well. (laughs) But the thing is, is that wasn't my last job either. I worked at a liquor store. I actually worked at a couple liquor stores. I cleaned houses. I worked a bunch of different jobs. You know, at one point I was the operations manager of a crane Uh, certification company and that that job was unique that job was what I was studying that's what I was going to school to learn yeah I wanted to be um, you know I was studying business well that's what I was studying that's what I thought I was going to love was just going into business for myself. And so becoming an operations manager was a dream come true. And you know what I learned from that job? I didn't like it. It wasn't my calling. It didn't pay enough, for one thing. And it didn't make me happy. It didn't fulfill me. At the end of the day, I didn't feel like I made a difference. And so... From that time on, I knew I had been running from my calling. This is what I wanted to do, but I never thought I could. And I know I'm not alone in that. We all spend our days looking for what's going to make us happy, looking for what we're called to do, for what God wants in our lives. And I think back to an old TV show from the 80s. And I've been thinking about this because I've been watching Picard. And if you've watched Picard, you know that this season, and if anyone has not seen this season, this is not really a spoiler. (laughs) Because they announced this a year ago. But this season is very much a love letter to the old next star trek the next generation and it has it had me thinking about another show that if they can bring back the next generation after 30 years then when are we going to get that cheers reunion (laughs) when when are we going to go back to that bar where everybody knows your name I still remember the finale. I remember watching that finale and thinking this can't really be the end. 
And if they can bring back next generation, then why not Cheers? And I was thinking about how that ties into my experience of not finding my calling in life. And if you think about the bartender of Cheers, Sam Malone, he was very much someone who had not found his calling. He, and this is very much backstory to Cheers, he had been a pitcher for the Red Sox and had washed out of being a pitcher. He was a bartender with his coach, the retired coach of the Red Sox. And of course, they're actors. They were never really in that role. You know, it's not like they found old athletes to fill this role. They're actors. But, you know, if someone's going to go online and Google, did they really find an athlete? No, they didn't. <laughs> I'll save you the Google search. But Sam and his coach started a bar. Maybe they bought the bar. Who really cares? Because Sam had washed out as a pitcher. It was his dream in life, as is everyone who ends up as a professional athlete. It was his dream in life to be a pitcher for the Red Sox, but it turns out he wasn't any good at it. And after a few seasons, he washed out. And he went and started a bar. And you know he wasn't a very good pitcher because fans never come to the bar. <laughs> there, it's not like it's full of Red Sox fans even. You know, people there make fun of the Red Sox and get themselves kicked out of the bar. <laughs> so you know he was no good as a pitcher. But he was a great bartender. People showed up to watch him send those pitchers around the corner of the bar. You know, those pitchers of beer that just miraculously turned the corner because that was his calling. He was made to be a bartender. Being a pitcher was what got him there. Well, in the book of Acts, we see Peter. And Peter was never a preacher. Peter was a fisherman. He was a man who cussed and cursed. He was a man with no education. He was illiterate. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. And when Jesus met him, he couldn't preach either. But Jesus said to Peter, come with me and I will make you a fisher of men. And Peter's experience as a fisherman was what Jesus was looking for. As I stand up here, I am very much leaning on my experience as a Starbucks barista. Oddly enough, I am not a public speaker. I never took one class in public speaking. What I did was work at Starbucks for seven years, and I actually worked as what they called a coffee master. And that means that I studied coffee. I took classes on coffee and then I gave seminars on coffee. I led tastings. I stood up in front of people and told them about my wonderful expertise about coffee. Now, of course, if anyone from Starbucks is watching, um, yeah, most of that is made up. Taste is subjective. If you taste the notes of raspberry in your coffee, you're full of it. <laughs> But that's how, that was what prepared me for being a preacher. Very much standing up in front of people and telling them, this is my interpretation of this cup of coffee. Do you taste the raspberry notes? How is it with that lemon loaf? And it's very much the same thing with preaching. I get up here and I say, look at this passage with me. How does it tie into this story? How does it tie into your life experience? How, what does it make you feel? And if the cup of coffee makes you feel something, if I got up there and I described the cup of coffee and I described how it came from a war-torn region of Africa, 
and maybe that made you sympathize for the farmers, then guess what? I did my job. If I describe Peter coming from nothing and, and Jesus teaching him everything from scratch, leaning on that experience, and I've done my job. And I know that Jesus was a great teacher because Peter gave one heck of a sermon. So here, it's the Pentecost. And Peter, in chapter 2, is standing in front of a group of people who are traveling for Pentecost. It's a holiday. And it's not just a Christian holiday. It's a Jewish holiday. And he stands before them and starts to speak. And the people are amazed at his speaking. They say in verse 8, or excuse me, in verse 7, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? You see, the Holy Spirit has come into their presence and is translating for each and every one of them. And they're hearing it in their own language. But no, they don't have the Spirit yet. The Spirit is among them, but not within them yet. Go down to verse 12, where it says, All were astounded and were greatly confused, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others jeered and the, at the speaker, saying, They're drunk on new wine. You see, even though the Spirit is among them, not everyone can hear it. Not everyone is hearing what they're saying. Oftentimes I've got, gotten up here and given you a sermon and been congratulated on words that I didn't speak, on sentiments I didn't express, on passages I didn't read. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks when we speak because we have the Spirit. And that is what's happening with Peter. Peter is speaking, and people understand him. They understand him as if it were their own ideas, but some people are so far from God. You can speak the word of God to them, but they'll just think you're drunk. <laughs> and so some in the crowd, they get it. They really get it, because the Spirit is there with them, and others, they're too far from God, and they can't. In verse 14, it says, but Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, know this and listen carefully to what I say. In spite of what you think, these men are not drunk. For it is only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken about through the prophet Joel. And in the last days... It will, be God, it will be, God says, that I pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Now, if anyone tells you, oh, women can't, Preach. Women can't prophesy. Women shouldn't speak in the church because they're quoting 1 Corinthians. Note, in, uh, here in Acts chapter 2, men and women will prophesy. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians. Don't, any, don't ever let anyone silence you. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will perform wonders in the sky above and miraculous signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be changed to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day the Lord comes. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That last line is the good news. He goes on, men of Israel, listen carefully to these words. Jesus the, Na the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God 
with powerful deeds, wonders, and miraculous signs that God performed among you through him, just as you yourselves know. This man, who was handed over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you executed by nailing him to a cross at the hands of Gentiles. But God raised him, raised him up, having released him from the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. For David says about him, I saw the Lord always in front of me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My body also will live in hope because you because will live in hope because you will not leave my soul in Hades nor permit your holy one to experience decay you have made known to me the paths of life you will make me full of joy with your presence and i'm sorry i pause a lot the uh, new english translation has some very strange wording <laughs> He says, brothers, I can speak confidently to you about our forefather David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In fact, that's an important point, isn't it? Because David says that his soul will be in Hades. Everyone who has died goes to Hades, but not Jesus, because it can't hold him. And this is the good news, that Jesus has conquered death. We always think that the enemy is Satan, but Satan is a title. In fact, it's a title that applies to multiple people. In some instances in the Bible, Satan is the emperor of Rome. In other instances, Satan is death. And when we see Christ risen, Satan is the enemy who has been defeated. That is death. Because Christ died his death on the cross and was raised again. And through baptism, so each and every one of us is raised with him also. We go from life to life. For Christ has defeated the one and only enemy, death. It says, brothers, I can speak confidently to you about our forefather David, that he is with us to this day buried in the tomb. So then because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, David, by foreseeing this, spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his body experience decay. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses to it. So then, exalted to the right hand of God, and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now those are fearful words. Because we, even today, have crucified Christ. We who have sinned have nailed him to the cross with our very sins. But imagine living in that day, being in that crowd, knowing that 40 days earlier, you were the ones shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And now Peter says, here is a crowd of witnesses who all saw the man that you murdered raised up by God and is now sitting at the right hand of God. And he's the Messiah. He's the one you have to go through for salvation. Oh, what a fearful thing. You can imagine being in that crowd and people just being despondent because they know 
salvation has slipped through their fingers. It says in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed. I think, I think my translation understates that by a bit. They were acutely distressed. I think another translation says they were pierced to the heart. In fact, they probably fell to the floor. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For, for the promise is for you and your children and all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. Who's the perverse generation? Who's he talking about? Well, those would be the people that thought they were drunk, the ones who are so far from God that they can never recognize the truth. But notice he says, save yourselves. This is very strange language. We're taught that salvation is the free gift of God and not by works, lest any man should boast. Paul writes that to the Romans, not by works. Here Peter says, save yourselves. Because he's told them what to do. Repent and be baptized. and receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to their number. You know the truth when you see it. And I know that I preach this a lot. I preach that salvation comes through the truth, not through adherence to dogma, not through the right beliefs. Because if we had to have the right beliefs, then everyone who lived 400 years ago died in their sins. And we might not have, have it right yet. But here, everyone one of them is saved because they were pierced to the heart because they heard the call of God and they responded. So if there are any who need to be baptized, and I know everyone here has been, but maybe there are some who are far off who hear the call. If there are any who need to be saved, and come to church. Send us an email. Give us a call. They're not right this second. <laughs> come respond to the call and be saved. It says that they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And that's what we'll do. Every time we meet, we break bread, we pray, and we fellowship. We bear one another's burdens. And that is what makes us the church. So, before we sing our song of praise, we go with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the life of your son. We thank you for the powerful message that you have given us through Peter, that you gave him the courage to stop being a fisherman and proclaim.
proclaim your word to all the lost. Lord, we pray that your light shine through us, that each of us finds our calling, no matter how late, no matter how early, that when we hear your voice, we drop everything and we walk and we find our way to you, Lord. That when we are called, we give up everything. That we let nothing stand in our way of finding you. That we follow your voice wherever it leads, Lord. And that we always have the courage of our convictions to be the church, to be the family that lives in and pleases and exalts you to the entire world. In your son's name we 